Go. Welcome everybody back here to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in uh, uh, Midtown Manhattan. It's a beautiful day, actually a summer day, uh, kind of a freakishly warm day, close to 30 degrees Celsius here uh, in New York City. And we we'll talk about climate and the Earth and the planet we all share and what's happening. I think it is a very good, a good day uh, for that. Actually, we are also close to Earth Day on the 20th. And um, the Siegel Center for a long time now has seriously engaged with the questions, how can and how should and how must theater performance um, react um, to be uh, able to raise the awareness of this global crisis we are in, but also to be part of the solution and find, find answers and also represent on that highly symbolical space on the theater um, um, important, meaningful contributions um, that uh, contribute towards an understanding, but also help us to take actions to be part of the change we want to see. And with us today, we have one of the great workers in contemporary theater, I think, who is uh, a combining a work of theater, um, but also theater at a university as a historian and science, literature, and politics, uh, Frédéric um, uh, Ait Tuati. And uh, she is uh, based in Paris, but right now she is touring with a work that is very close to what we are talking about. And we are slightly late because there was a problem um, um, with the uh, connection, but now we have Frédéric with us. Hello, how are you? Hello, hello. I'm so glad to see you. Thanks again for the invitation and for this opportunity to continue our conversation that we started a few years ago. Yeah. Where are you and what time is it? Well, it's uh, six twenty p.m. Uh, I'm in the hall entrance of a fascinating theater uh, in the middle of uh, Normandy, near the coast. Um, it's a rainy day, but I am in this stunning theater, which has been made by the British architect Andrew Todd, and it's actually an Elizabethan theater made a few years ago from the original Globe Theatre uh, model, but also inspired by contemporary theatrical design and also by Japanese uh, wood uh, and bamboo making. So it's a stunning place. And if you want, I will enter yes. the rehearsal, I mean, the, the real room in a few moments uh, to show you we are still uh, rehearsing because we perform in less than two hours tonight at eight. Um, and we perform Moving Earth, which is part of the terrestrial trilogy, which I guess we will discuss today together. Yeah, it's inspired by the work of the late Bruno Latour. You were a collaborator with him. You influenced him very strongly. You, you, he influenced your work. Um, tell us a little bit, what, what, what is that project about where you say this is worth the time of my life, my research and everything I'm working on? Well, um, this terrestrial trilogy is a very important work for 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 me and and I I guess for Bruno as well. We started it together in 2016 uh, with a very simple idea that I suggested to Bruno. We had been doing some plays already for some years, and at some point I told him, "Look, Bruno, I think it's time for you to go on stage and to actually perform." your ideas, not as fixed, finished ideas, but as hypothesis, as a way to actually try on stage the most difficult concept of our time. So our idea was that theater was very well equipped to tell us something about our changing world. So it's not only about, you know, what is the link between theater and ecology, it's actually the idea that theater is one of the places where we can actually uh, try to understand collectively what Bruno called uh, a change of cosmology. Um, so it's, in a way, it's much deeper than the question of how to adapt to climate change as artists. It's also how to feel and how to uh, understand the, the big uh, change that we are experiencing. So the, the very first idea of Inside, which is the first of the three plays, was that we have actually a rather poor vision of the earth. We consider 
the earth as a globe on which we live as human beings. And the first, um, uh, I would say, thought experiment that we made in inside was to consider that, uh, okay, let's get rid of the globe. What happens if we get rid of the globe? Where do we stand? What is this kind of strange space that we are in? Um, and we really believed that theater was one of the interesting way to test that question of space, because of course, theater is also a, a question, a problem of set design of how do you inhabit a space? Uh, so that's the very first conference that we made together called Inside. Um, if we're not on a globe, where are we? And the second that we made together a few, year, uh, a few years after is called Moving Earth. That's the one we will perform actually in a few hours. Uh, and Moving Earth really tells the story of the invention of the Gaia hypothesis. And again, this Moving Earth project is based on a thought experiment. The experiment is to put in parallel the big Galilean revolution and our cosmological revolution of today. Um, so Bruno, again, on stage, was performing this, this thought experiment. And I'm calling that a thought experiment rather than uh, um, a, a text or whatever, because Bruno was improvising in front of the audience. Uh, and he was improvising and testing his hypothesis. <clears throat> And after Moving Earth, we did, uh, during the pandemic, a third one called Viral. Uh, and Viral, again, is a way to say, okay, what is the consistency of this new space we are in? If we're not in the globe, if we are in the critical zone, if we are part of Gaia, what does that mean, really? What is the principle of, of this Gaia in which we live? Um, and we used in a very provocative gesture, I think, from Bruno, we use the idea of virality, virus, as, a, as an interesting metaphor to, to understand uh, what is the specificity of uh, inhabiting the Earth, which means that we are not on any planetary, um, planetary uh, system, we are not on any um, planet, we are not, we are in a very specific one, which is characterized by the fact that everything is entangled, the living forms are constantly interacting, and that we are very deeply intertwined, as the virus showed us in a very terrible way. But it could also be understood in a positive way, uh, this kind of uh, uh, lockdown. We are locked down in a critical zone. And what does that mean for us? So you see three thought experiments. And at the end of the day, we thought, okay, this is a trilogy, actually. This is a terrestrial trilogy. It's a trilogy about what does that mean to be on Earth? Yeah. And um, to all our viewers, um, why this work is so important and so significant and, um, and something we all should think about is um, that, um, to, 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 to re-quote what Frédéric said, we are in a revolution on this planet Earth compared to the time in a way of Galileo who came up and said, the Earth actually moves around us on a complete change of a worldview, of a paradigm, and right now, um, and we had that talk with Thomas Oberander, with whom you also collaborated so beautifully on the great Down to Earth project for the Berlin Festspiele. Um, and now we are moving in this th time of the Anthropocene, in, the, in, a, in a time on our planet where what mankind has done, created, influence, has changed the planet irreversibly. It is the first time perhaps in 100 or 200,000 years um, uh, you know, of, of the existence of mankind where now we are experiencing uh, catastrophes, uh, modern tragedies. And we're going to have that talk with um, Avra next uh, next uh, Monday. So what does it mean to be tragedy? But it is uh, in many parts of the world, what happened is a tragedy. And the work um, of Bruno Latour and of uh, Frédéric um, is really discussing this, how, uh, how do we understand that the world has radically changed and it doesn't really care if we notice it, if we you know, pay attention, but theater has to be part of it. 
Frederic, um, in this trilogy, which you did now for 10 years, how long are you involved with it? No, I mean, the, the, the first part of the trilogy is from 2016. 16. The second part from 2019, and the third part is 2021. So it's quite recent, actually. Quite recent, last seven, seven eight years, uh, plus the preparation for it. What, what did you learn from it? What are the big lessons? What did you learn? Ah, it's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, I should say that Bruno said very often that the trilogy helped him to um, make his concepts more accurate, more specific. So we learned a lot from doing, in a way. We, we, we learned by, by making the trilogy. Um, it, it should be said that the trilogy is in no way an adaptation of Bruno's text or mm -hmm. ideas. It was before the text. Um, we, we created those performances, plays, I don't know how to call them, conference performances. We created them while Bruno was writing and working. So they were really like a, a laboratory for us. So we developed in a way this uh, idea that the theater can be a very powerful laboratory where you can test and try different ideas. Uh, so I would say that's the first thing we learned. We learned that, yes, uh, theater is not a place only for uh, sharing ideas or showing, or, uh, but it's also a place of making, making concept, making ideas. The second thing we learned, um, I think, uh, is very much linked to the place I am in today. Um, our main hypothesis was that we need a new theater of the globe, a new globe theater. We need to reconnect to somehow the time of Shakespeare, not because we have to go back, of course, but because we need to, in a way, to, to close down the modernist period. You know, it was one of... <laughs> Bruno's great and provocative uh, thesis that something was starting, beginning uh, during the 17th century, which is the big modern um, ideal. And that nowadays, this ideal is crumbling in front of our eyes. So the question is um, really, how do we understand this new, new world? What do we do with it? How do we uh, draw it, shape it, understand it? And what are the tools so that we can actually understand this world? And there is something very uh, important in the trilogy, which is the, the idea that we actually don't know the world we, we enter. We don't know it very well. We don't have the, the right metrics. We don't know how to measure it. We don't really understand it. And in a way, um, this is what was happening at the time of, of Shakespeare. Um, and so we, we were discussing a lot this idea of what is the new Globe Theater um, and, and, and where, where do we stand in it? And of mm -hmm. course, this new Globe Theater is full of, sorry, there's a bit of, uh, theatrical movement around me. So the, this new Globe Theatre is made of new actors. That's one of the things we learned, new actors. Bruno was talking about agent. He was talking a lot about the question of agency. Uh, and of course, theatre is a good place to test agency. It's a good place to invite new actors on stage. Um, and again, this was an intuition, first of all, the intuition that the, the Teatro Mundi, the, the, the world stage is not only made by humans, but what was interesting is that this intuition, little by little, was um, met 
by all the readings, all the books, all the discussions we were doing at that time with Anna Tsing, with Donna Haraway, with Isabel Stengers. And for me, it was very moving to see to what extent theater, reading, writing, uh, thinking collectively was going on together. Um, let me think, what did we learn as well? I think we learned a lot from the audience reaction. We learned a lot from uh, the way in which people were telling us that they were moved, deeply moved by the radicality of Bruno's hypothesis. Um, for instance, the people were very interested by one of the idea of moving us, which is that the cosmological order and the so uh, social political order move together. That's one of the things that we decided to develop in moving earth. The idea is that when you move the way you see the earth, the cosmos, then everything moves. And of course, this is something that Bertolt Brecht had already said in the life of Galileo. And that's the reason why uh, Bruno was so happy to work with theater, because this great intuition, which is in Brecht, that when you move the, when you make the Galilean revolution, of course, everything moves. And that created, for instance, the, uh, um, the carnival in Florence in 1632, where everything seemed to be changed. All the traditional hierarchy, social order was deeply moved. This intuition, if we try to apply it today, then it's very stunning that, at least to me, after doing the trilogy, when when I consider what happens in terms of, you know, the the, the gender revolution, the, the change of understanding of what of what is, you know, the couple, the family, love, uh, the society, everything is moving at the same time. So what we consider as a purely scientific problem or economic problem, which is the uh, the uh, the climate change, should be actually widen up in a way should be understood as a much broader cosmological revolution that really influences all the aspects of our life yeah yeah and it, it, it is such a big uh, question um i agree with uh, Bruno Latour is such a famous of course french philosopher and also you and with your something very big has moved and has changed whether we acknowledge it or not or whether we just go on and watch broadway shows or engage in work like yours it has already happened and the big question is like also what brecht felt he was facing is how do we represent um, that new world are we how are we part of that uh, a world no longer just representing it but changing it but now also to really ask our uh, participants to to become um, active in it and what i find so fascinating about the work you know, very often we are based at the university people say universities are dead nothing comes out of it it's the last place where innovation comes from they actually 10 15 years late someone writes a book until it gets printed and gets a professorship the time is over um, here, actually, um, you are a historian, a 17th century early modernist, um, and Bruno Latour, a significant voice in contemporary philosophy, continental philosophy. And he was interested, if I understood right, in theater also as a model, as an idea that he said there are actors, the viruses, the plants, the animals, the humans. We have to understand we are part of a much larger system, that idea of the Gaia Earth, where everything is connected. And theater not only can help us to understand that complex uh, universe on our planet, which we live in, but also it put, potentially help us to find uh, a, a ways to, um, to have a meaningful life, to contribute to an adaptation of that what's coming and uh, and great artists anticipate the future. That's what Ancia said, with traditional forms like a globe theater, but you know, with new technologies that come in. And um, 
it was for Latour and for you, uh, was theater interesting as theater theater or was it because Freud often got attacked for good reasons. The Oedipus was only interested in the myth, but he wouldn't go to a theater play. He would never say, let me stage my ideas. Um, how significant was the engagement with theater for developing um, um, his ideas or was he just demonstrating or was it influencing? I would say, I would try to answer you in two different ways. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand why Bruno Latour actually went on stage. It's important, it's important to understand that his own conception of science is very theatrical in a, in a good way. He, he, when he analyzed Pasteur uh, in one of his first very important books, uh, Pasteur, War and- Louis Pasteur, the great virologist, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's it's a book from uh, 84 that Bruno wrote when he was only 37. And he explained in that book that um, the way in which Pasteur made him believed uh, when he understood the importance of microbes and viruses was by doing what he called the theater of proof. So the, the theatrical metaphor was already present in Bruno's work well before I met him, but it was a metaphor. He was using theater as a way to describe um, the working of science, the working of demonstration, the working of experiment. And of course, there is a long historiographic uh, tradition of analyzing experiments as a kind of theater of proof. And here, I think, of my master in Cambridge University, Simon Schaffer, of course, who studied this idea of public experiment. Now, there is a very strong, and I would say historical link between theater and science. And this was, I think, the first reason why Bruno really took theater seriously, not only as a way to share ideas, but also as a way as I was saying earlier, to create ideas and to, to test them in, in the strong meaning of, of test, épreuve, we would say in, in, in French. Um, so yes, that, that's, that's one aspect. And then there is this idea that, oh, the, sorry, I lost, I lost your, your question. I had a second thing. Maybe if you rephrase your question, I will find my second point. Second point of it. Yes. Um, how, um, in perhaps in opposition to a Freud, you know, who used theatrical uh, metaphors, the Oedipus complex or whatever, but not really um, a deep interest actually in theater as an art form or in the way theater artists work, you know, that they agree on an opening night and then they have a certain time of day and then they do agreements and do a research actually a scientific also research in a way as we as bright said of the the children of the scientific age uh, were his plays and now as we say we have the children of the digital age um, we create work for um did um did the theater the process of making art which is radically different from a five-year business proposal or from you know set rules you know where the unexpected happened or where um there are you know uh, 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 new things unexpected things happen there's space is given for it and it shows in the in the final result did this work uh, uh, influence his philosophical writing and his ideas um, that became so significant and important yes absolutely so yeah the second thing i wanted to say is uh, beyond the fact that uh, theater was already a metaphor, you're absolutely right in saying that the, the making of art was absolutely key in Bruno's um, philosophical oeuvre, I would say. Because he considered, like, like a few philosophers, that art as a art was a specific um uh, I would say veridicity, veridicity. I don't know if it exists in, 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 in English, but let's say that art was a specific mode of existence. 
So this is deeply linked to Bruno Latour's uh, great book, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, L'Enquête sur les Modes d'Existence. What this really fundamental book says, amongst lots of things, is that there is a special world of art and fiction which really has its own way of acting in our world. And Bruno was really interested in the, in, in the specific way in which art was creating our world. And before we, we met, he was, he was not doing theater, but he was already doing some kind of art because he was very interested in the format of the art exhibition. Uh, and he was doing what he called um, Gedenke exhibition, the, 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 uh, des expositions de pensée, uh, mm. thought exhibition, which was, as you see, another way to, uh, to, to, to try his ideas, but not only in, um, I would say, in, in a... Um, uh, he didn't only want to use artists and art, he wanted to collaborate with them because he believed that one of the great questions today is a question of form, is a question of how do we shape the world? And, and I think that's one of the points on which we were completely connected and on which we completely agreed is that you can't really face Gaia if you don't think in terms of aesthetics and also in terms of politics, of course, philosophy and sociology. But if you, if you put aside aesthetics, then you, you lose uh, an, an immense part of the question. And I think it is this um, faith, so to speak, in art, that made Bruno's thought so powerful. Um, as I said earlier, he was taking theater seriously and he was taking art and artists seriously as specific kinds of thinkers, of makers. And when you think of it, it's very interesting because the Gaia hypothesis says that what is around us has been made, completely made by uh, organisms. You know, that's why he was so interested in Lynn Margulis, for instance. We were reading Lynn Margulis together during the last years of Bruno's life a lot. And really, even more than Lovelock in a way, Lynn Margulis explains to what extent everything around us comes from uh, organisms. And it's not by chance that this world is adapted to life. It's just because life made this world. So this kind of reversal, deep reversal of point of view, when I think of it with you today, um, then if we take that idea seriously, then you can understand why art is so important because it's part of our human way to make the world. Really, I mean, everything around us. And one of the things we, I mean, I am really interested in, and, and, and I think Bruno would have said the same, is the way in which there is a strong link between our way of thinking and way of doing. How do you go from a concept to a form? How do you go from an idea to a building, an architecture? How do you go from an intuition to a form of art? How do we, how do you go from an hypothesis to a play, you know, and this um, relationship between thinking and doing, um, in a way, one could say that Bruno spent his life doing things. He was thinking by doing things. He created a new kind of school. He he was working with architects, engineers, web designers. He was fascinated by designers, design. Design, because design is really this 
making through thinking and thinking through making. So you, you can see why um, theater was so enjoyable for him uh, as, as a way to explore this fascinating um, passage, I would say in French, this fascinating um, movement from uh, what you have in your mind and what you create as a human. So deeply, he was believing that art was something that could change the world, I think. Uh, and that's the second thing I wanted to say. Now I, I remember one of the reasons why I think this trilogy was important for us and maybe for other people is that it's not a way to face catastrophe which um, makes you despair. It's the contrary. And that's something I, want, I would like to say today in memory of Bruno is that working with him was just um, everyday joy. And that's something so important. We were working on terrible topics. We are facing a terrible situation. And I think one of the immense strengths of his thought was that it was never about despair. Uh, it's, it was an active thought. Again, this idea of agency is everywhere in his thinking. Everything is agent. Everybody can be an agent. Um, it's all about making, again, new forms, new books, new, new works. Uh, and that's something which is so terribly moving to think that in the last four years, Bruno knew that he was ill. We all knew he was ill from 2019. And I remember very well that every month he would tell me, look, what are we doing next? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he, he really, um, for all the listeners, you know, I, mean, I so wish I would know much more about his work, but he thought about this idea of a critical zone of what's above 10, 20 meters, the earth and below 10, 20 meters, that it, it is actually life that gives life, the plants, like what is alive now has been for millions of years, the precondition, but also is now, nothing has changed in that. And the question is, how do we live with it and we understand that we are um, part of it. And, um, and I think this idea, what he said, he was interested in design, like a tool, also a tool in a way is a, a representation of a thought, of a theory put into practice. It's useful. Um, and it is at the time it was manufactured, the highest, uh, hopefully the best way to do something, to achieve something in theater in that way um, is uh, connected to it. Let's talk a bit about Gaia. I think for you, of course, it's an everyday word you use. I don't think it's so much uh, in the minds here in the uh, US or in the in the Americas. We might do actually a conference uh, in next spring about uh, Gaia and the idea of a Gaia theater. You said to face Gaia, Bruno said, you have to be prepared. You have to know what you're doing. You did uh, the uh, Gaia Global Circus. So you faced it. So tell us a little bit about this idea of that word, where it comes from, why, why is it important? Why is it significant for someone who, a student who was listening for the first time? Um, what, what is it about? Well, the first time I heard about Gaia is when we were writing, Bruno and me, a little article, which is online, I think you can find it, which, um, which is an article from 2009. So it's a long time ago. And I remember we were looking for an ending. The article was about theater and science and why already, why theater is such an interesting laboratory. And the very last line, I remember very well, Bruno said, oh, I know what is the last line. It's, and now Gaia enters. And I thought, what is that Gaia? And why does she appear right now at the end of this article? And it was the moment when Bruno, I think, had read through Isabel Stengers this fascinating idea that the earth has created its own condition of 
habitability that the earth has and not only the earth but the living organisms in the in the earth have made life possible that life has created its own uh, environment so this is the idea of gaia it's not and bruno said it many times it's not the idea that the earth is an organism it's not a holistic idea it's not this kind of you know new age conception of the earth and bruno spent many many years trying to say what gaia is not <laughs> because of course it's a it's a mythological figure so it's very easy to to frame it um into something a bit um you know yes like a, like an allegory and it's it's complicated that's something we discuss a lot in moving earth in in this second performance we say okay gaia makes the whole idea so complicated but it also says it all it's also very telling why is it, is it such an interesting name it's a name because in a way it's also a, a theatrical figure of course it's a way to dramatize what's going on so again bruno was very um mixed about it sorry I, i'm just trying to I'm just trying to say that, yeah, Gaia is, is, is an interesting mythical figure. Uh, it makes the whole discussion a bit complicated because it doesn't sound scientific. But at the same time, it's a very interesting character to stage. So in Gaia Global Circus uh, that you, you are mentioning, it was our very first collective attempt to do something with this character which was just appearing in, in a variety of philosophical texts. And again, what is very interesting for me is to see to what extent some concepts were moving from um, biology, physics, um, chemistry, the, the realm of science, to the realm of philosophy through Isabel Stengers and Bruno, and then we were trying to do something with it on stage. And that happened again with the concept of the critical zone, which is the same kind of idea, but a bit more, um, uh, let's say, a bit more acceptable for uh, scientific colleagues. But Bruno, until the end of his life, was ticking to this concept of Gaia because he liked, I think, the mythical aspect of it. He liked this, the fact that Gaia is not a nice character, that there is something uh, dangerous about her, uh, that there is something uh, frightening about her. And of course, that gave the title of his last book, not his last book, of his, his one of his important books about ecology called Facing Gaia. Um, and in the in the title facing Gaia, you can see that it's it's a question of it's a question of action. It's a question of positioning yourself. Where do you put yourself in relation to this threat? Yeah. No, I think it is uh, it is a, a quite um, a stunning um, that um, to to to. Um, to perform uh, what you've learned, uh, to, to perform knowledge, uh, to investigate knowledge by doing and do something, uh, what you think about. The big question, if we move our arm, did we think it first or did the arm move? Uh, and very simple, choreography, um, to what ultimately what we show on a stage. So um, let's say you have this world of ideas, which are so very, very significant. And I encourage everybody to really engage with the work of Latour, James Lovelock, and everybody, uh, Frederick mentioned Frederick's uh, work, um, because I think um, it is what we need to be thinking about and finding ways to, uh, to come to an understanding and meaning of our life, um, to how do we inhabit the place now and how should we inhabit it best in this changing, paradigm and things have already changed 
whether we talk about it today or not, of politicians and whatever parties accept it or not, it has happened. It is there. It's a fact. And the question is, if we really think about representing the world, if it is as the mirror theater has to act and also think about what is urgent, what is important um, in that bright um, sense of um, um, that we all have to role to play. And additionally, because the space of theater is so symbolic and so fought over, how can, who gets to show what, what's the best, what's important? It is important what we look at and it's important what is being presented. So for all the presenters, it is something to think about as well as for everybody who creates art, it has to be a part of uh, our work. And as Thomas Ober and I also reminded us, at the time of just human interactions, personal conflicts, father, son, uh, families, or uh, civilizations, of course, um, perhaps it is not the most significant, but now we do find, have to find a way to include animals or plants or the thinking about it in a different way as a thought exhibitions. It's a beautiful word, maybe also for a theater, it is a thought exhibition where you sit on a chair for an hour or two and instead of running through a gallery where you look for a couple of seconds as a piece of art and then you march on and you really sit and meditate and open and uh, for your mind for part of change but if we come to that now Frederic um, these are ideas which at the university let's say we sit in seminars we often have those and we think about it then we go home and but you a different, of course, and Bruno, you put it on stage. What solutions did you, how do you do your theater, your Gaia theater, if I may say so, if it falls under that umbrella? What do you show on stage? How do you work? How do you rehearse it? How do you come to agreements with objects, actors, light, sound, uh, whatever, plans? How do you work? What do you put on? How is your process? Of course, it's interesting to start by trying to make the difference with the academic world where I come from as well, where Bruno comes from. So we are very much, we were very much used to what you were saying, this world of seminars, conferences, articles, books. And, and this is a very, very important way of doing things. Uh, what we were trying to do by going in this kind of amazing places like today was to explore some of the things we were not not able to explore in our seminars we were not able to explore in our books precisely because these are um, aspects of um, our world that somehow need some different tools uh, it's the question of affect, feelings, emotions, sensations. But when I say that, I feel that it sounds a bit weak because we are academic. Academic people, we deal with rational ideas, don't we? We don't feel with, we don't deal with emotions and feelings. However, that's what moves us. <laughs> that's what makes the difference. And what I like so much with theater is that you can really experiment with what Bruno was calling the texture of Gaia. This is something which is very difficult to grasp, but if what the geophysicists and biologists tell us is true, uh, we need to completely reconfigure our ways of feeling, sensing, seeing, understanding. That's why the work of Anat Singh, for instance, the mushroom at the end of the world was so important for us. The way in which she uh, explains, for instance, that narrative can be a kind of method that dancing is the only way to find a mushroom, but maybe also to find an idea. This way of of, of uh, going beyond the kind of epistemic frontiers that our academic world has set is, is really important for us. So yes, obviously there was this need to explore um, not only feelings and passions, which are very well explored by theater, but also the need to explore sensitive things. For instance, what you can do on stage 
is to change scale. You can suddenly, um, you can try to understand what it means to see the, the, the earth from outside and you can suddenly be inside. That's the title of one of the things. What does that mean to be inside? It is a conceptual question, but it is also, I would say, um, a phenomenological question. It's also a question that you have to experience with your body. So I think the, the question of the body is, is, a, is a very good reason for me to go on stage. Um, because it's about where do you sit, where do you look, how do you look, from where do you look? That's one answer. The second answer, I would say, is about landscape. Because one of the things that this Gaia theory changes, of course, is our relationship to nature, to the, human, to the living things. And as you know, theater is one of the places where our understanding of nature as a landscape was actually created. Uh, it was also created through painting, as we know, through the work of you know, perspective painting, natural painting. There's a, there's a beautiful work on, on many beautiful works on that. But if nature is not a landscape anymore, then what is it? And what I find fascinating with theater is that it, it participated in a way in this making of the modern understanding of nature. But because it participated in that, it can also be the place in which you test an other relationship to nature. So you can actually have the audience on stage, you can change the viewpoint, you can uh, you can put into question the way in which you 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 look at you know other other living things. Uh, so it's it's an amazingly plastic um, art, actually. Sorry, I think I lost track again. No, no, of so perfect. No, it's good. So, but so how does it work? So you have bodies, you have students or actors, you read texts and then you uh, do movement, you do body training and or do you design uh, like a Bob Wilson, you do a sketch, how things work. How do, how do you work? Well, there is no such thing as a, as a, as a single method that I could just mm -hmm. uh, give because each time we started with a question, uh, a problem in a way. And the, the, the problem was, first of all, an always uh, intellectual and body problem in a way. For instance, where do we stand or how do we stand on earth? Which was this problem of insight. Are we moving on a globe or are we moving in the critical zone? Okay, so it was, it sounds very theoretical, but in fact, it's a question of, where do you stand? Mm -hmm. uh, where do you look the globe from? If you look at, if you think of the globe as, um, as a globe, it means that your gaze is outside. This is the point of view of Sirius. It means that you are on Mars or on the moon, and then you see the earth as a globe. But if you are not on the moon, and you and me, we and very few people are on the moon, then what do you see? Then what is the earth? So you see, it's both theoretical and very practical. And for me, this is a, a stage problem. And then it starts to be interesting because then I start to think, okay, how do I show that? How do, how do I show and how do I share with the audience this change of viewpoint? Then I use very practical things that we love to use in theater, which are, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know how you say that, a tulle, a, a grim, this kind of transparent cloth that you can uh -huh. put in on the stage. And then I decided that Bruno should be inside this kind of stage. And as I told you, I, I, would, I would work a lot with the question of scale. And then I would, I would use 
drawings by uh, colleagues, uh, chemists, um, biophysicists, geophysicists, architects, and I would try to change their drawings into stage images. And that already is another problem. How do you make scientific image into, into stage design? How do you go from two-dimensional to three-dimensional space so that the audience is actually plunged into something and not only just watching a drawing? And then there's also the question of the tone. And then it was very interesting for me to direct Bruno, so to speak, and to tell him, look, what we would like for this conference is not a conference. What we would like, because it's a performance, because we're on stage, we would like you, we would like to be in your mind. We would like to follow your thought. And that was one of the things I discovered with the trilogy is that actually what is theater? It can be drama. It can be, as you said, father and son uh, arguing on stage like uh, in Phaedra by Racine, Thésée and Hippolyte. But it could be also the making of a thought. That's amazingly theatrical. And that's what I discovered with Bruno. If you see something thinking, if you see somebody thinking as beautifully as Bruno, then it's, it's a play because it's full of agents, ideas, contradiction. So one of, my, um, one of my line of thought was really, how do I catch the theatricality of thought? of somebody thinking. So that was one aspect. But I didn't want this thinking to be like a, a, a talk, like a lecture. I didn't want Bruno to lecture the audience, you know. I wanted something which was more like we are following his ideas and we are plunged into the process of thinking. And the way I think we managed to do that is by changing a little bit the voice, the voice of the philosopher. It's not exactly when you listen to the recordings you can find on the internet on, of Bruno performing inside in, in English or in French, actually. He's telling you a story and he's telling you a story about his thinking in a way. He's telling you the story of his research. He's telling, he's sharing with you his questions, his interrogations, his doubts, his puzzles. Um, and it is something I liked because it changed completely the hierarchy. You know, we have this old, that's, that's something we shared a lot as well. The idea that we can't, if the, if, if the world is really changing, if we are entering a new cosmos, then the old hierarchy of the philosopher on his chair talking down to students, this is over. And this is something that theater can show very well. And of course, I was using the fact that Bruno was a great respected philosopher who accepted not to be staged as a star philosopher. He was completely lost in the images. He, his voice was, he was playing himself with his own image. So that's something interesting also for me to, to, to rethink not only the, let's say, the, the cosmology, the vision of the earth, but also the hierarchy uh, even of, of knowledge. And one of the things Bruno was saying, which was so inspiring for us all in the company, was that facing Gaia means that we are known, that our fellow scientists, colleagues from the Earth System Science, uh, our friends, philosophers, sociologists, artists, um, and the people in the audience, we are all at the same stage we are all puzzled. And that's so powerful for me to rethink this, this hierarchy of knowledge and to take 
the theater as a place where this collective dazzlement can be um, can be articulated. Yeah, that is true. That's really true. And um, we are in theater. We, we love it, but it is something theater can do. And I don't know how much a film or TV, you know, that uh, is now so strongly in the minds of everybody of next generations for whom often theater seems to be uh, old fashioned or for people who didn't make it in television and film, they get stuck there or something. Say, so, no, it is something very different. And we see, as you say, as thinking on a stage, you know, our brains inside are nothing but a chemical soup. Uh, there are no hard drives inside. Uh, what we what we remember is processing actually what we saw before. There are no fixed images. It can be changed. Actually, that's the great hope. And what we see is an extension of the brain. Your play is your brain is an extension of it. We see you in relation to objects and movements, and uh, it's beautiful. I also like what you said, this paradigm, where are we? Everything is relative. Actually, while we speak now, uh, planet Earth is turning 2,000 miles an hour around itself. Uh, in 20,000 miles an hour, we, we race around the sun right now. And the entire solar system is, I think, with 200,000 miles on the, is speeding towards the star sign of Leo as we speak. You know, everything is in movement. Unbelievable. And, um, and we forget about it and that complex system that gives life. And Linné, who said, uh, you know, have respect from the plant. Everything lives through it, humans. And we are no longer the central actor, the godlike presence on Earth where, you know, you said the hierarchies are changing. And we have to accept, understand, and show that animals, plants, the viruses, you know, that we, it's, a, it's um, a, a complex system and that uh, life has a need to be supported. A very old indigenous uh, cultures for a long time have known that and we have to rediscover that as you also said of the idea of the globe where the roof was opened, where animals were I guess right and next left to it, where the bears and dog fights took place outside, but there was some kind of a connection um, to that world. But you, you promised us to show us a little bit of that uh, theater. Um, as you said, it's a kind of an uh, architectural uh, representation, manifestation of a new thought, how to, how to interpret, reinterpret the globe theater. And maybe we see a bit on your stage. If that's possible, that would be wonderful. What time is your show going on? What time does it start? In, in 45 minutes, but the, the audience will come before. Will come but before. How many people are involved in it? Are they animals, plants, people? Uh, how many people are no, part because of the technicians? It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the conference performances that we did with Bruno. So it's uh -huh. one actor on stage, One actor. But lots, lots of things going on. So I just yeah. show you the inside first and then yeah. the outside. So... That's the inside. So it's it's a beautiful round Elizabethan uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. yeah, the idea a, of the circle, yes. You, we need to sit with in the circles. With the circle, mm -hmm. you see. It's all in wood. And you actually have on the screen the beginning of the show, which mm -hmm. is a silent, silent film with Italy, 1632. Galileo, and on the on the right side you have the great climate demonstration of the youth a few years ago. So that's the the start of the show, and you have Duncan even on stage who will perform. Hello, everyone. <laughs> in so he's Bru he's Bruno. He's performing Bruno's thinking. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so that's why we can continue to have the trilogy on tour because Duncan was working with Bruno and me for years mm -hmm. and it was completely natural to have him on board uh, when Bruno started to be too weak mm -hmm. to perform. And I just wanted to show you outside this place, which is absolutely stunning. If you can see mm -hmm. a little bit of it. Amazing, yeah. So it's a very, very beautiful piece of art. And it's like a little globe theater, you know, in, in mm -hmm. the middle, in the middle of the countryside. So it's a real, it's very meaningful for us to, to perform here 
today. Um, and it's in the Normandy, uh, what town is it? Yes, it's close to a little castle called Ardelo, mm -hmm. castle of Ardelo behind me. And it's very near Boulogne-sur-Mer, near the sea. Um, so yes, it's uh, rather north than Normandy, actually. It's the north part of France, not very far from Calais and Dover and... Uh, uh, yeah, we are just next to the to the to the ocean, actually, to the sea. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a wonderful um, 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 place um, to 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 give the audience something to to think about. Um, what are your upcoming plans? What are what are you thinking on now? Um, obviously, you know, you would, won't collaborate in a sense of a life sense with Bruno or Bruno Latour. What what are your upcoming plans? What's on your mind? What are you what are you thinking about? Well. For now, I think that I should go and and help with the with the show in in a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in in the long term, um, I I have new new plays coming. Actually, I made a new play a few months ago with another philosopher friend called Emmanuel Ecotia, Uh and it's a play about how to inhabit the world. It's called Earthscape. Uh, it's it's a world play world. World, world, world play, play. Um, mm -hmm. about um, uh, landscape and soundscape. So it's it's about how to inhabit, uh, which is a way to continue the thinking for me. Yeah. Uh, so that that was staged actually two days ago in Paris, but mm -hmm. we created it in November and we will perform it in various places. The Israel trilogy is still on tour, obviously. And then I have a few new projects with other writers and performers because the, you know, we are just starting. We're just starting to think and to, to create new, new forms because yeah, uh, the more, the more I, I, I age, <laughs> the more I think uh, we need new plays and new new forms of art to understand what's going on. That's what well, you, fantastic. You are certainly doing brilliant research, great research, and and you know also that idea to combine politics, science, theater, literature, um, ecology, economy um, in a new way. It's a, it's a stunning, and I hope you will be back. You were last uh, fall in the. Uh, here in uh, New York City. So really, thank you for taking the time. I know how hard you work and how much you work. So it means a lot to us um, to have you uh, for this um, time with it. It's very significant. It's very important uh, contribution and work and um, what you do. And um, I would like to thank you in the name of everybody watching from the Siegel Center and the New York and the American and also global community that uh, that watches. So um, I hope to uh, uh, see uh, more of your work um, um, soon. And to our listeners, thank you for taking the time um, to listen to artists. It is significant work and they find answers. I have questions that are also relevant and important for your own life, your own practices, and we should take it very, very serious um, because they are the ones who live not only in the present, but anticipate the future and uh, help to find us ways to deal with it in a meaningful way. Next Monday, we have uh, Avra Siri Ropoulou with us from uh, Greece. Um, she created a book uh, on the, what is the idea of a tragedy? What is a 21st century tragedy, and how do you represent it on stage uh, in a way also as Frederic uh, is thinking about that tragedy that is happening and, at the moment to our planet. And it's not an academic question. It's not a rhetorical question on uh, just an artistic, uh, aesthetic uh, a problem. We uh, facing real consequences uh, in the moment where we are. And there is urgency to engage with it and to find solutions. So um, we also are question: what are those tragedies? How do we represent them in a meaningful way, but also in a joyful participation in those sorrows and uh, complications of life. So thank you very much. Off to your stage. And um, yes, thank and you so much, Frank, for this fantastic. conversation. It was yeah. great. Yeah, it was really important to hear the idea uh, to see a thought on stage developing. How beautiful really is that? And thanks to Halran, Thea, um, and Vijay for help us, Talia here at the Siegel Center. And thanks to really to all our listeners. It's actually just for you to listen to. And uh, and um, this is our audience. So hopefully it will be meaningful and makes a contribution to your own thoughts. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.